Maxon just released the latest version of Cinema 4D, R25, and I think it's going to be one of the most talked about releases in a very long time. Stay tuned to learn why. Okay, here we are, my friends, R25, and whoo, lot has changed in a single release, right? We got a darker UI that creates the higher contrast that we got over in Adobe apps. We got completely, completely redesigned icons all over the place. We got icon groupings in totally different places and a lot more viewport real estate, which I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate. And the more I spend time here, the more this kind of looks vaguely familiar to another app. I forget the name. I think I haven't used it because it's like really expensive. Or no, I don't, I can't remember. But anyways, I know you're probably saying, you know, what the heck, man? There was nothing wrong with the old UI. Why change it, man? And I'd say, stop calling me man, dude. And I know, you know, a lot of people don't like new things. Luckily, if you are totally put off by this and this is too much of a shock to your system, there is a handy switch to revert to the old layout. So if you go up to this upper right corner, check off the new layout toggle here and click standard and you're gonna go and revert back to the R23 layout with all of the icon groupings where you're used to them, albeit you're still gonna be dealing with the redesigned icons. Now, I feel like it's a lot to switch over to a new app and have icons be number one, completely redesigned and number two, being in completely different places. So I even highly recommend that if you are diving into R25, use this legacy layout to just get used to the new icon designs and kind of build that muscle memory again. And then once you're used to those new icons, you know, go ahead and switch back over to the actual R25 version because there are a lot of nice quality of life features in R25 that can make retraining your brain a little bit worth it. But I will admit it does get a little while to get used to, but this is the future of Cinema 4D and there's no better time than now to work on building up that muscle memory here. So let's talk about, aside from everything being new and strange and scary, what are some of the cool quality of life updates? Well, you notice we have all these different icon groupings. One of the cool thing is being able to slide these groupings wherever you want. And even at the bottom here, we can slide the icon groupings to say here, if this feels a little bit more comfortable for you. And if you're really not a fan of these tiny icons on the top here, you can always go and right click and just go to icon size and just go back to large icons. And this will have the icons the same size as previous versions of Cinema 4D, these icons on the top at least. Now, as you're getting used to these new icons, another thing that might be helpful for you is to right click and go to show and show text and right click again, show, show text below icon. So now you have these bigger icons I mean, you actually make them smaller, but now you have these icons that actually have the names of everything attached to them. So again, another handy way to begin to get a hang of these new icons. What are they? And just getting your brain used to what's what. Now this redesign is trying to make things a little bit more efficient for the average Cinema 4D user. You can see that all of the objects that you can add to your scene are in this menu this new menu right here that is right next to your object managers. So there's a lot less pixel distance that your mouse has to travel to start populating your scene with geometry. Now, one of the cool things is with all of these icons kind of spread out more all across your interface, there are new icons that are docked in your menu. So if we go over to the left here, you got your spline tools and added to this side menu is the paint tool. We got the guide tool and one of my personal favorites, the doodle tool. So you can go in here and, you know, let's doodle a little mustache or something like that. But I like having this doodle tool and some of these other tools just kind of there and at the ready. You'll also notice right here, this little widget. And this is actually really cool. This is your previously used tools. And Maxon added this nice little widget to your HUD that you can just quickly go and toggle between all of your previously used tools. 
Another cool thing is in some of these menus, you can actually search within them. So I can type DO for doodle and it will just filter out the doodle paint tool. You can also do something similarly in the object manager. If I right click on an object, you can see that if I want to get a constraint tag, I can just type in constraint would also help to actually spell it correctly and filter out just those tags that would have a tag in it that contains the letter C-O-N-S and you can add your constraint tags. So pretty cool that there are these new search options within some of these menus. Another very nice quality of life update is the dynamic menus that are now inside of Cinema 4D. So what are dynamic menus, you may ask? Well, there are menus that adapt to whatever tool or mode that you are in. And you can actually right click on this menu and choose what kind of dynamic content you want. Do you want it to be based on document mode, your active tool, active object types? You have a lot of options there. So what I mean by dynamic menus is if I grab this polygon object and I go to polygon mode, you're gonna see all of these icons on the left changed. And all of these tools are relevant to polygon modeling here. You got your bevel tool, your extrude, you got your weight subdivision surface, you got welding, you got the line cut tool, you got the iron tool over here. If I switch over to edge mode, you'll see that this also updates for edge specific modeling functions and tools. If I go to point mode, we're gonna go and get point specific tools, populate this side menu as well. So pretty handy, especially if you're a modeler and you dock these things all the time and it takes up space. This way you'll have all these icons just appear whenever you need them and should help speed up some of your workflows there. Now you'll notice that in some of these menus as well, we have these new sliders here where you can either scrub a value here or these new redesigned sliders, which are actually really nice and easy to grab. If you ever wanna reset anything to default, you can still right click on the arrows to set that back to a default value. If we go over to the layers menu, something that's really cool is the ability to add layers and then also delete them. So in previous versions, if you wanted to delete a layer, you'd have to just select it and delete it. But now we have this little trash can button so you can actually delete a layer if you want to by hitting that button. Now, if we hop on over to the timeline and see what's new there, you can see there's this timeline icon right there. And one of the cool things is color coded X, Y, and Z tracks. So previously they'd just be all gray tracks, but now you can see that the tracks match the color of the axis. And if you hit tab to go to F curve mode, you can actually see the text of the X, Y, and Z tracks are color coded as well. So a lot easier to visually see what dimension track you are dealing with. Let's go ahead and close that up. Another nice new addition to the default docked icons are right down here in this little timeline menu. One tool that I use a ton is Cappuccino and Cappuccino is now docked in the timeline here. And basically what Cappuccino is, is your After Effects motion trace. You can move an object around and it will actually convert your mouse animation to keys. So definitely check out Cappuccino if you haven't played around with it before. Another cool thing is these project tabs. So it's almost like a web browser where you can tab over to other project files here, add new ones, close them right from here. Pretty cool new functionality as far as toggling between different projects. You don't have to go into a drop down menu or anything like that. You can just tab over like you're in a browser. And I'm gonna save the best for last because my personal favorite is this snazzy new jiggle deformer icon and the melt these two right here these new icons like i want t-shirts of these icons right here it's my personal favorite there now you might be wondering like where did some of these things move to like everything's kind of reorganized and stuff like that like where are the snapping tools they used to be over here well the snapping tools are up here if you enable snap, there's also this snaps settings, which has a lot of the snap options that are easily accessible. You can check things on or off. They're not buried in a menu that you have to keep opening time and time again. So this is a welcome addition there. Here are your work plane modes. We have axis and soft selection. Here are your solo modes. Got viewport solo hierarchy and viewport solo automatic, and then toggling the solo on and off there. Dig the eye logo. Now you might be wondering, okay, we found out that the timeline's hidden down here by clicking that button, but where's the coordinate manager and where's the material manager? 
Well, again, a lot of these things are hidden by default to give you more real estate in your viewport. The materials are hiding in this little icon right here. If you click that, here are all your icons. You can choose the style of view here. You can increase the size of your icons and all that good stuff here. And you can toggle that material manager on and off by hitting Shift F2. And then the coordinate manager is hidden right down here. So Shift F7. And there is the coordinate manager. Now, one of my least favorite parts about this UI is that the reset transform, AKA the old reset PSR button is buried in this coordinate manager down here. You can see there is your reset transform. And I always loved having that reset transform docked in my menu. So in that case, it's very easy to kind of solve that. Just hit shift C to bring up commander. Just hit reset and you'll grab that reset transform and then just dock it wherever you want up here, maybe over here. And voila, you just made this a little bit more efficient. And as always, if you want to save a layout, if you do a bunch of changes here, you change the icon size, all that good stuff. And you want to save this as your default startup layout. Just go to window customization and go to save as startup layout or go to save layout as if you just want to save this and toggle to it at some other point in your workflow. But that about covers a lot of the major UI changes over here. We got the new content browser over here that is always updated, which is another cool recent addition to, I believe, S24. So they're always going to be updating here. Now, as far as notable new features, Maxon did add a lot of updates to, say, the scene nodes and the scene manager. But to be quite honest, it's still not production ready. So that leaves R25 pretty light on updates that impact your average C4D user. But by far, one of the coolest updates in R25 is called the track modifier tag. So if you do a ton of animation, the track modifier tag is a game changer. This replaces the old time tracks workflow that was pretty laborious and we'd use a lot to retime animations and, and stuff like that. This just kind of adds on to it, adds so much more functionality. You can see that here is my original animation, just a simple ball bounce and some squash and stretch. And on each of these other spheres, I have a track modifier tag that's doing different things. So here I have a track modifier tag that is speeding this animation up by two, so doubling the speed. Here I have an animation that I actually just changed into linear keyframes. And this track modifier tag is just smoothing everything out because it's set to smooth mode. And the cool thing about this is you can actually extend the range of the keyframes that it's smoothing. And you can almost think of this as a Gaussian blur radius, like the higher the radius, the more blurred out the uh, image is going to be. It's like with this, the more smoothed out the overall animation is going to be. So you can see without this, this is just a very linear animation. Just kind of smooth that out. Really, really nice. Smooth as butter. And then this one is a... Same ball bounce, but we have posterize on it and you can change the frame step. And it's almost like, you know, you can have an animation that's fully keyframed that's being animated on the ones like here, this is the default. And then you can just hit a couple buttons and you're animating on threes or fours. And this is super, super cool just to posterize your animation like this. And then we have this springy which is an easy way to just add springy effects, like a delay effector effect to your existing animation track. So the thing to know about the track modification tag is that it needs an animation track to exist to modify it. OK, so it seems pretty simple. But let me just run you through how this works really quickly. I'm going to right click on this original animation here. Go to animation tags, go to track modifier, and you can see we have the default being spring, okay? But if I go down to posterization, you can see that the frame step is set to one, and I can adjust that frame step to get this stepped animation. And you can see that this isn't really taking into account the squash and stretch. So in the inclusion, you can actually say, okay, I also want you to take in the animation tracks of any children objects in this hierarchy. So I'll turn that on. And now you can see that that posterization effect is now also applying to that squash and stretch factor animation, which is super cool. You can adjust the offset of the animation as well. 
Let's reset that back to a frame step of one. So we're back to our original animation. Now, if we wanted to retime this animation, we could up this time factor to say 50%. And this is actually going to slow this down by half. Okay. Or by a hundred, like this is slowing this way, way down and to speed it up, we'll just go to a negative time factor. So super cool and procedural way to be able to adjust animation. There's also this noise option too. So you can add, you know, animated noise to different properties and stuff like that, which is kind of interesting right now. It's adding it to my squash and stretch. And in the strength, you can actually adjust what you want this track modifier to actually control. Do you want it to add control to the position, the rotation attributes? So the attributes is actually controlling the attributes of that squash and stretch. Another cool thing is if you wanted to say on this original animation here, let's just delete that modifier tag. If I just wanted to add some track modification to this factor, I could just right click on it, go to animation and go to add track modifier tag. And what that's going to do is automatically set in that factor track into the inclusion so I can independently adjust or maybe smooth out just that animation track of the squash and stretch and nothing else. Okay. Which is really, really cool that you can isolate individual tracks or just affect all tracks all together by using that hierarchy option. So super cool. And this is just kind of scratching the surface. I'm just going to show you a quick animation here. And you know how, you know, spider verse, we got animation on the ones, the twos, the fours, and you know, it just really helps sell the storytelling and adds texture to animation. This track modifier tag, I can't wait to see more texture and animation for sure, because here I have this original animation here. And then with that original smoothed out animation at 30 frames per second, if I just hit play here, I can use track modifier tags to animate on the twos or the fours. And you can see here on this track modifier tag, the frame step is every four frames. Okay. On the twos, we got the frame step every two frames. And then on the twos and fours, I actually have here hold keyframes on the frame step. So I'm changing this from a frame step of two to four and then back to two, back to four, and then back to two. So I'm adding texture to my animation by using the underlying original animation that you can see here and then just keyframing this frame step, which is super cool. And I can't wait to play around with this a lot more. So you can see there's so many creative things you can do with this tag. So if you want to see a tutorial about this feature and how to animate with it, definitely let us know in the comments. Now, if you use a lot of paths and import a lot of paths and logos from Illustrator, this next new feature is going to be huge for you. It is called the vector import tool and it's in our generators menu here. And basically what it allows you to do is open up an Illustrator file. So let's open this up here. And if I go over into Illustrator, to show you what this original Illustrator file is, it's basically what this is, is just a fill with a stroke. And what the vector import does, it not only imports your paths and extrudes them, but it also imports your strokes as well. So you don't need to do that create outlines on your stroke. It just imports automatically and you have all of these different types of options, path spread, extrude depth. You can, you can adjust the extrude depth pretty easily here. And then you have individual sweep options for that stroke that we brought over from Illustrator. So we can change the depth and go to negative depth here. You can add some rounding to really round that out really nicely. Like so there is a growth. You can actually animate the growth of that stroke on, and then you can actually offset this and maybe get a little something like that. So pretty cool. You can also go and check on this hierarchy You can actually see all the things that were created. So we get this sweep object in this extrude object. So if we want to make this editable, this is what we'll ultimately get. So this is just a much easier way to work with paths from Illustrator. Now, one last new notable feature in R25 is the inclusion of the public beta version 
of Redshift RT. Now, Redshift RT is a feature that was actually first teased back in early 2020. It's the real-time engine version of Redshift. And it's very similar to Blender's EV render, where it's pretty close to real-time rendering. So Redshift RT, you can literally turn on with a switch and it's going to pretty much try to match the same results you're getting with Redshift standard ray trace renderer while allowing you to use the same shaders, lights, and other options. Unfortunately, it's only available for users with a DirectX capable system. So what do you think of this new look Cinema 4D? What do you like? What don't you like? I mean, this is the biggest change in look and feel since Cinema 4D was created. So I'd be really interested to hear what you think. So be sure to leave those thoughts that you have in the comments section below. Me personally, it took a little bit of time to get used to feeling even the most remote comfortable in our 25, maybe two weeks of using it full time to get the hang of it. And you do start to see how the quality of life improvements affect your day to day. But then you kind of see how other things kind of affect your day to day like Things like having that reset transform button being buried in the coordinates manager and some other things that you would have to get used to. But it is going to be interesting because we're getting a little peek into the future of not only Cinema 4D with scene nodes and the scene manager, but Redshift with Redshift RT. So it's going to be very interesting to pay attention to see beyond these first steps where Cinema 4D goes. So if you want to keep up to date with all the latest news in Cinema 4D land and the MoGraph world in general, be sure to like this video and be sure to ding that bell so you'll get notified of all of our latest videos at School of Motion. Now, if you'll excuse me, I gotta go pick up my Jiggle Deformer t-shirt, so I will see you in the next video. Bye everybody.